Hello everybody, it's Jabari here. Have you ever wondered what Africa would be like today without European influence? It's a question that's always wandered throughout my thoughts. Just thinking of the powerful centralized kingdoms and governments and states that existed throughout the African continent, and just wondering what would have happened if they had never been conquered or destroyed by European powers. I'm no expert in African history, but I do think I know enough about it to be able to give you guys a decent picture of what Africa would be like had it not been colonized by Europeans. Obviously, this isn't going to be 100% accurate and will rely on lots of approximations as there are very many variables that can influence the outcome of African civilizations. However, based on what Africa was like prior to European conquest, as well as the cultural norms, the traditions, and just the overall direction that the people and the societies were going during this time period, I would do my best to formulate a picture of what Africa would be like if it was allowed to grow and develop on its own without any European influence. So before I get ahead of myself, let's discuss the European influence of Africa. Europeans first began trading with the West African coast in the mid 14th century. Trade was largely friendly and very mutualistic, and Europeans viewed Africans as equal trading partners. Warfare was minimal during this time, and the few times it did happen, Europeans were usually met with crushing defeats from large centralized kingdoms and their militaries. It took over 500 years, however, for Europeans to finally acquire the ability to conquer Africa militarily due to significant military technological advances during this time. Once Europeans realized this, they decided to hold a conference in order to prevent warfare amongst one another. This was the Berlin Conference between 1884 and 1885, during which they decided what parts of land would be claimed by what countries. They effectively cut up the African continent into a bunch of pieces with complete disregard for the borders that had already existed there by native kingdoms and empires. Needless to say, these African civilizations were not very happy with what the Europeans wanted. Thus, the European conquerors were met with lots of resistance. Ultimately, however, European military superiority became too much to handle and over 90% of the African continent fell into the hands of European powers by the end of the 19th century. Liberia was spared because it was a safe haven for former slaves. Ethiopia was the only African country that was able to preserve its independence through a military defeat of a European power. Alright, so now that we're all caught up, now it's time to discuss what Africa would be like had Europe not colonized the continent. TheBigThink.com is actually where I got a lot of this information from. They did a really awesome job at it, and I will leave a link to that article in the description of this video. So first off, we have to discuss why Europeans never did come to colonize Africa in this alternate scenario. During the 12th century, the bubonic plague, or the Black Death, swept across Europe, reducing the population by between 30 and 60%. The plague was basically a medieval equivalent to the modern-day AIDS epidemic in Africa. It took over a hundred years for Europe to reach its pre-plague population levels. So in this alternate scenario, we'll say that Europe's population was reduced at a much larger scale, something comparable to the Native Americans when they were exposed to old world diseases such as smallpox, measles, and influenza. Had this happened, there would really be no powerful civilizations such as Spain to go over and discover the Americas. Reconquista would have never happened, so Muslim holdings in Europe such as Al-Andalus would still be alive and breathing. Not only would it still be alive, but it may very well have gone to expand and conquer all of Western Europe. If this were the case, Christianity would have lost its foothold in Europe and Islam would have become the predominant religion. Which brings me to my next topic. Most of Africa is very Romanized. Most of the countries speak European languages, use Latin characters in their writing, and practice the Christian religion. Unlike the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, African religions are very tolerant. In most African societies, religion was not forced upon you upon penalty of death nor were there penalties or holy wars for the sole purpose of converting people to their religion. Similar to East Asian religions, they're really more of a way of life or a moral code than anything else. With all that being said, it is highly unlikely that any African religion would have really taken a foothold in 
encompass all of the continent or any large significant portions of the continent. And don't get me wrong, this is not to say that African religions were some kind of insignificant tribal in the mumbo jumbo because they most certainly were not. They were very widespread and very important to the people who practiced them and still are to this day. Not just on the African continent, but also all of African diaspora in the Americas including the Caribbean and Latin America. One such example is Voodoo, found in several Caribbean islands. So again, not to beat a dead horse, these religions were very important to the people who practiced them. They just weren't nearly as aggressive or imposing as Abrahamic religions were. So some of these religions may very well have survived and thrived and expanded to conquer territories. However, the only one that would have done this at any type of consistent rate would probably have been Islam. Within a century of its birth in Mecca, Islam quickly spread all throughout the Middle East, Southern Europe, as well as Northern Africa, and along the East African coast. It even made its way to Western Africa, influencing empires such as the Mali and the Songhai. Even non-Islamic empires such as the Shanti had Arab scribes and cartographers for map making and record keeping. During the mid-15th century, however, Islamic influence began to slow down due to European trade that began to take place during this time. And of course, as they've always done, these European traders brought with them missionaries to convert local natives to Christianity. In this alternate historical timeline, however, the bubonic plague ravaged Europe would have lacked any native civilizations capable of making such long-distance trades with sub-Saharan Africa. The few, if any, that would have been capable would have been the ones that fell within the realms of the Islamic Empire of Al-Andalus. So if anything, Europe would have contributed even more to the Islamic presence on the African continent. So now that we've established that the Islamic presence in Africa would have had a much larger effect and a much greater influence on the African continent in the absence of European powers, now let's discuss some more of the greater effects it would have had on the continent. For one, the largest and most successful empires on the continent would have been Islamic. And not because they were superior in any way, shape, or form, but simply because they had a greater network of other Islamic empires to connect with, ally with, and just overall expand their empires and influence with. Secondly, those that were not converted to Islam would have been greatly influenced by Islam as far as their writing system and their map making systems. With that said, Africa probably wouldn't even be called Africa as Africa is a name derived from Europeans. Since Africa lacked many native scripts, Arabic would have held its weight as the dominant writing system. Arabs themselves referred to Sub-Saharan Africa as Zanj, which means Land of the Blacks. The BigThink.com called it al Kabulan, which apparently also means Land of the Blacks. They also have the map oriented upside down, with South being the top of the map and North being the bottom of the map. As opposed to Europeans who had a more Eurocentric view of the world, having Europe at the top of the world and everything else at the bottom, Arabs viewed it the opposite, with Europe being at the bottom and everywhere else being above Europe. This would quickly catch on in Africa considering a large portion of the continent straddles the equator. Despite this extremely large Islamic presence on the African continent, Traditional kingdoms would still exist under traditional languages, religions, and ways of life. Many of which would grow and expand and even absorb some of these Islamic empires. The reason for this is that Islamic and Arabic presence on the African continent was largely slow and methodical in comparison to Christian and European presence. Unlike Christian and European nations is that the entire economy and political structure of the African continent was firmly tied into that of Islamic and Arabic empires and had been for several centuries. Islamic nations also had strict codes in regards to waging warfare against fellow Islamic nations. This allowed traditional kingdoms to grow and develop technologically and economically, without just suddenly being overwhelmed by foreign influence. European nations, on the other hand, were in a state of constant warfare, fighting for dominance and intense competition with their neighbors. On top of this, they were never directly tied to the economy of Sub-Saharan Africa, so they kind of just showed up on the doorstep one day and did everything they could to grow and develop on their own terms. They also had significantly less tolerance for African religions, viewing them all as satanic. Moving back to the alternate scenario, however, of the bubonic plague continent of Europe, most of the landmass would lack any type of organized civilizations or empires. Any part of Europe that was outside of the realms of the Islamic empires would probably consist of mostly small tribes and bands of people, and maybe a few smaller city-states, even a few small kingdoms. The influence of these small kingdoms, however, would only rest within the confines of the European continent similar to how most African kingdoms were at the time. 
However, they would be considerably less wealthy and less populated in comparison. Despite the stronger Islamic presence and the lack of European presence, there still would be Christianity on the African continent. The reason why is because there always has been, ever since the birth of Christianity. Ethiopia is the oldest Christian nation in the world. Though historians are unsure of when Christianity first arrived in Ethiopia, King Ezana the Great of the Aksum Empire made Christianity a state religion in the year 330 AD and Ethiopia has been a Christian nation ever since. Ethiopia, however, lies in Northeast Africa, completely surrounded by Islamic nations. Because of this, it is highly unlikely that Christianity would have reached West Africa or Central Africa, which is where most African diaspora can trace their ancestry from. Ethiopia probably wouldn't even be called Ethiopia, as the name Ethiopia derived from Ancient Greek, which means burnt face. Until the modern era, Ethiopia was actually known as Abyssinia, and without European dominance, that name would have stuck. Another thing that makes Ethiopia, or Abyssinia, unique on the African continent, aside from being Christian, is the fact that they had their own unique writing script. This ancient script known as get Ease, which is still in use today, was used to write down Amharic, the most commonly spoken language in Ethiopia. Though some African people were already using their own scripts prior to European arrival, most of them were symbolistic and none of them were as widespread as those of the ones like Ge'ez or Arabic. Nor could they really be used to write anything as intricate as a full-blown book or novel. One good example of this would be an African script known as Nsidibi. In this alternate timeline, there would be more scripts developed by more African nations for their own unique languages. This certainly held true during the time that Europeans were trading with African kingdoms. Several attempts throughout the continent of Africa by many rulers were made to create unique scripts designed specifically to their unique languages. Most of these scripts, however, died during the days of European colonialism. Some are even still in use today, but none of these have actually taken an official status within the country. But with Europe out of the equation, these scripts would have grown, developed, and spread like wildfire. So one big question you guys probably have now is, would there still be slavery? And to answer that question, it would be a yes and a no. And what I mean by that is, would there still be slavery at all? And that would be a yes. Would it be the same type of slavery practiced during the transatlantic slave trade? No, it would not. The difference is, the slavery practiced by Europeans was something known as chattel slavery. When Europeans first began purchasing slaves from the West African coast during the mid 15th century, Naturally, many people had mixed feelings about buying and selling human beings as property. Over time, Europeans began to think of moral reasons as justifications for enslaving people, such as the fact that the natives of the areas that they enslaved people from were not Christians. Eventually, the all-too-familiar, unquestionably racist views of Africans began to develop. The subhuman status that Africans eventually acquired became the ethical basis and legal justification for the enslavement are viewed as disposable property and inferior from a genetic level. So simply having African ancestry made you doomed to enslavement. And there really wasn't anything you could do about it. African slavery, however, was quite different. The types of slavery varied depending on what part of the continent that was practiced, and in some places it wasn't practiced at all. You also weren't considered property or disposable. You were still considered a human being, you were just unfortunate, either a prisoner of war or a criminal. In some cases, neighboring kingdoms and tribes would deliberately raid one another for the sole purpose of capturing slaves for profit. This practice reached astronomical levels upon contact with European traders. Despite the wide distribution of slavery on the African continent, as well as the many variations of slavery and the brutality associated with it, it was never in a way that would take away the humanity of those captured. The Mali Empire, for example, had its own medieval Bill of Rights. And in Article 20, they specifically outline, Do not ill-treat slaves. We are the master of the slave, but not the bag he carries. In this alternate timeline, however, almost all slavery would remain within the confines of the African continent. The Arabic world would be continuing their medieval practice of a transcontinental slave trade. And this would extend not only to Africa, but the European continent as well. Similar to the Barbary slave trade, but on a much larger scale. So one would be more likely to find white slaves on the African continent than black slaves on the European continent. However, these European slaves would rest almost exclusively in the North African Arabic speaking countries, with few exceptions that can be found in other Islamic countries of Sub-Saharan Africa, such as the Mali Empire. 
So in short, yes there would still be slavery, but it wouldn't be the same type of dehumanizing chattel slavery as that of the transatlantic, nor would it dramatically disrupt or disturb the economy or politics of the African continent, as did the transatlantic slave trade. Last but not least, I'm going to fully dissect this map by TheBigThink.com and I'll express everything I feel about it. All of my opinions, all of my gripes, and all of my praises, and anything else that comes to mind when I look at this map. First off, I'm noticing that every square inch of the African continent has been cut up into a little piece. Like, there are borders between every country. They're all drawn out neat and pretty, and they all have names. Well, that's perfectly fine for areas like North Africa, West Africa, and East Africa, I still think that a lot of the continent would lack any type of official borders. And the reason for this is very large portions of Africa, more particularly the interior of the continent as well as the southern portions of the continent, were still pretty tribal. There were still very, let's say, embryonic civilizations there. They hadn't reached any form of centralized government or kingdom yet. I mean, don't get me wrong, there were some pretty large and powerful kingdoms in the southern and interior of the continent. For example, the Zimbabwe Kingdom of Southern Africa, the Zulu, for example. They were all very powerful civilizations and very large civilizations, but they were the exception, not the rule, of those regions of Africa. And this is especially evident in areas like here, like this uh, zoo and Kung, for example. Those were hunter-gatherer Khoisan people. They were hunter-gatherers. They were nomads. They, as you can you can tell, because you know there are no cities in these areas. Those weren't really countries or kingdoms or centralized establishments. They were really more of realms of wandering tribesmen. And it's not that I don't think they should have been represented on this map, but they should have just been labeled differently instead of having hard borders like the rest of these kingdoms do, they should be represented by like maybe a little red haze or highlight or something, just to indicate that they're a wandering group of nomads, similar to the Toreg of the Sahara Desert. I also praise the creators for trying to be as non-Eurocentric as possible, for example having the map oriented south to north instead of north to south, but at the same time, I noticed there are still a few relics of European influence. For example, Benin is a Portuguese corruption of the native name for their country, which was Ubinu. But as I mentioned before, it is pretty much impossible to tell exactly what direction the African continent would have gone, considering there are very many variables that could influence that, so they obviously didn't fully dissect it and put all those things into account. All in all, without European influence, I think Africa would have been a more stable continent economically and politically, and civilizations would have grown and progressed at a more casual and regular rate similar to the rest of the world, with occasional technological innovations and introductions such as firearms, which would temporarily give certain areas an edge over their rivals. Anyway guys, let me know your thoughts and your feelings on this. I know there's a lot more that I could go over, but this video is already pretty long. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and don't forget to leave me a like and a subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.